This is Space Time, Series 23, Episode 132. Coming up on Space Time, discovery of a likely source for the famous WOW signal, a Bose-Einstein condensate created in Earth orbit, and assembly begins on NASA's first SLS rocket. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study may finally have narrowed down the likely source of the famous WOW signal. The 72-second long extraterrestrial signal detected by the Ohio State University's Big Ear Radio Telescope in 1977 was so strong and unusual, astronomers circled a printout of the signal data, writing the term WOW next to it in the margin. For years, it was thought by many to be the most promising sign of possible extraterrestrial intelligence. That's because it seemed to be so unusual from anything occurring naturally in nature. But the signal, which originated from the HD 164595 system, was never repeated, nor has anything like it ever been observed in any other part of the sky. And so, for many, the signal has long since faded into history. But now a report on the pre-press physics website archive.org claims Alberto Caballero has narrowed down the likely source of the WOW signal to a distant sun-like star, catalogued as 2 mass 1928-1982 minus 2641-23. The star was detected in detailed observations undertaken by the European Space Agency's Gaia spacecraft. It has a similar temperature, radius and luminosity to our sun. The new Gaia data provided more detailed three-dimensional observations than astronomers had available to them when they had previously hunted for a source for the signal. Mind you, there are some 66 other stars in the catalogue identified by Caballero as potential candidates. But all have far weaker supporting evidence. This is Space Time. Still to come, a Bose-Einstein condensate created in Earth orbit and assembly begins on NASA's first SLS rocket. All that and more still to come on Space Time. NASA says its Cold Atom Lab aboard the International Space Station is opening new windows on some of the fundamental physics of quantum mechanics. Quantum physics accurately describes the universe on the subatomic scale, providing a foundational understanding of quantum properties such as the wave nature of electrons in silicon. These properties are important fundamental aspects of modern technology used extensively in things like electronics, ranging from old-school transistor radios through to the most advanced supercomputers and cell phones. And although the first quantum phenomena were first observed more than a century ago, scientists are still learning about this realm of the universe. In July 2018, the dishwasher-sized Cold Atom Lab became the first experiment in Earth orbit to produce a fifth state of matter, known as a Bose-Einstein condensate. Bose-Einstein condensates are states of matter that only exist just above absolute zero, a temperature at which atoms would theoretically stop moving entirely. In Bose-Einstein condensates, groups of atoms behave as if they were just a single giant atom. This allows them to serve as a valuable tool for quantum physicists. Because all the atoms in a Bose-Einstein condensate have the same quantum identity, they collectively exhibit properties that are typically only displayed by individual atoms or subatomic particles. The colder atoms are, the slower they move, and the easier they are to study. Thus, Bose-Einstein condensates can make microscopic characteristics visible at the macroscopic scale. But unlike solids, liquids, gases and plasmas, Bose-Einstein condensates don't form naturally. And that's where the Cold Atom Lab comes in. It uses lasers to cool down atoms to ultra-cold temperatures, creating these Bose-Einstein condensates and allowing scientists to study their basic quantum physical properties in ways not possible in the 1G environment on Earth. Dave Aveline from the Cold Atom Lab science team at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, says even dating back to when the very first Bose-Einstein condensates were made, 
physicists recognized how working in space could provide big advantages in studying these quantum systems. On Earth, scientists produce Bose-Einstein condensates in a vacuum, but the atoms are still pulled down by gravity and they quickly reach the floor of the chamber, which typically limits observation times to less than a second. To get around this, previous ultra-cold atom experiments have used sounding rockets, or they've dropped their specially designed hardware from the top of tall towers in order to create a few minutes or seconds of weightlessness. But the weightless environment of the space station allows Bose-Einstein condensates to float around without touching surfaces, thereby resulting in far longer observing times. From its perch on the orbiting outpost, the Cold Atom Lab has provided scientists with thousands of hours of microgravity experiment time, allowing them to repeat their experiments multiple times and to exercise more creativity and flexibility in the experiments they conduct. And ultra-cold atom facilities in space should also be able to reach colder temperatures than earthbound laboratories. One way to do this is to simply make the ultra-cold atom cloud slowly expand, which causes them to get colder. And it's much easier to do that without gravity pulling the atoms to the ground. Longer observing times and colder temperatures both provide opportunities for deeper insights in the behaviours of atoms and Bose-Einstein condensates. This report from NASA TV. It's kind of crazy to think that you make something cold by shining light on it. Normally we think about shining light on something and making it hot. Laser cooling does something quite counterintuitive. It makes something cold by shining light on it. Temperature is about motion. The molecules in the air in this room are moving really fast, about 300 meters per second. If you cool down a gas, you're making the atoms and molecules move more slowly. And getting to the lowest possible temperatures, that's the extreme that we're trying to go to on Cal, and we learn something new when we go to those extremely low temperatures. We start with atoms that are actually room temperature, even a little bit hotter than room temperature. We just have a vapor of them in a glass cell where we use the radiation pressure from lasers to slow down atoms. As it turns out, light pushes on stuff. We don't feel it when we walk out in the sunlight, but for something as light as an atom, the push that you can exert by shining light on the atom, in our case, laser light, can be really significant. We don't actually use two lasers, we actually use six. So there's two this way, two vertical, two in and out. And so no matter which way the atom's moving, it's always moving towards one of the lasers and that causes it to slow down and cools them down to one thousandth of a degree above absolute zero. But eventually, to get to the temperatures that we need for Cal, we actually have to turn off the lasers. And what we do is we move the atoms so that they're held by magnetic forces. And what we can do now is we can just adjust the magnetic field so that this trap that they're held in is not very deep. So we can make it so that the most energetic atoms just have enough energy to just move off and escape and they fly away. We can actually pull out just the hot atoms, leaving the rest of them at a colder temperature. This is called evaporative cooling. It's essentially the same as when you blow on your coffee cup. The hottest molecules make it out of the water, and if you can constantly be blowing those away, you can cool down your coffee. And that gets us all the way down to these temperatures of a microkelvin, a millionth of a degree above absolute zero. But it turns out you can get even colder by using another really old trick called adiabatic expansion. If you take any gas and you expand it, it'll get colder. So we're doing the same thing on a sort of small scale. We have this little small sample of atoms that are confined by magnetic fields. Uh, and what we're doing is we're reducing the strength of that magnetic field, which lets the atoms expand out something like a factor of a thousand, which causes them to cool off by a factor of a thousand. This trick works so well, we get down to temperatures below one nanokelvin, one billionth of a degree above absolute zero. And it's being done on the Cold Atom Laboratory every day. And in that report from NASA TV, we heard from Cold Atom Lab Principal Investigator Bill Phillips, Cold Atom Lab Project Scientist Rob Thompson, and Cold Atom Lab Principal Investigator Cass Sackett. This is Space Time. Still to come, assembly begins on NASA's first SLS rocket, 
and China's Chang'e 5 sample return mission successfully lands on the lunar surface. All that and much more still to come on Space Time. NASA has officially started assembly of America's new SLS moon rocket. Engineers lowered the first 10 segments of the giant launch vehicle's solid rocket boosters into position inside NASA's iconic vehicle assembly building at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The heavy lift SLS or Space Launch System is humanity's first moon rocket since the days of the mighty Saturn V Apollo moon rockets and their failed Soviet Union counterparts the N1 back in the 1960s. The 111 metre tall rocket will undertake an unmanned maiden first test flight Artemis 1 selected for launch in November next year on a journey looping around the moon. It'll be fitted with an Orion spacecraft as well as a payload of CubeSats, which will be placed into a translunar injection trajectory. The Artemis 1 mission will be followed in 2023 by Artemis 2. That'll be the first to carry a crew, and it will also undertake a lunar flyby. Current plans call for the Artemis 3 mission, slated for launch in 2024, to return humans to the lunar surface for the first time since Apollo 17's historic mission in December 1972. At this stage, the fourth SLS launch will carry the Europa Clipper mission to Jupiter in 2025, with five more Artemis missions slated to fly by 2028. Stacking the first sections of the SLS's twin solid rocket boosters, which are based on those used on the space shuttle, on the mobile launcher, marks a major milestone in the Artemis program. It follows Northrop Grumman's recently completed first full-scale test of an SLS solid rocket booster at the company's Promontory Utah test facility. Meanwhile, the SLS core stage is still undergoing its test program at NASA's Stenner Space Center in Mississippi. Over the next few weeks, engineers will load the 65-meter-long core stage with propellant and liquid oxygen. They'll then carry out a full engine test burn, firing its four main space shuttle sourced engines to simulate a launch and ascent to orbit. But it's those two solid rocket boosters flanking the core stage which will do most of the heavy lifting during the launch. The boosters burn six tons of solid aluminum based propellant every second, together producing some 39.1 meganewtons of thrust, providing 75% of the SLS vehicle's total thrust at liftoff. This space time. Still to come China's Chang'e 5 lunar lander successfully touches down on the surface of the moon, and later in the science report, a new species of carnivorous dinosaur discovered in Argentina. All that and more still to come on Space Time. China's Chung'e 5 lunar lander has successfully touched down on the surface of the moon to collect rock and soil samples for return to Earth. The probe was launched last month aboard a Long March 5 rocket from the Wenchang Satellite Launch Center on China's southern Henan Island. The 8.2-ton probe, which includes an orbiter, lander, ascent vehicle and re-entry capsule, entered a 400-kilometer high lunar orbit 112 hours after launch and following a 17-minute orbital insertion engine burn, slowing the spacecraft down enough to be captured and placed into orbit by the moon's gravity. The lander with its ascent vehicle then undocked from the orbiter and descended down to the lunar surface, landing on a vast lava plain known as the Ocean of Storms. The mission is currently drilling down to two metres below the lunar surface, collecting up to two kilograms of rocks and regolith over the course of one lunar day, which equates to 14 Earth days. Those samples are being placed in a metal container in the ascent stage, which will eventually launch back into orbit from the top of the lander. If all goes well, it'll rendezvous with and dock with the orbiter. The ascent vehicle will then transfer its payload container to the orbiter's attached re-entry capsule for the journey back to Earth. After undocking from the ascent vehicle, the orbiter will reignite its main engine for the return to Earth. As the orbiter nears Earth later this month, the re-entry capsule with its payload container will detach and parachute down into northern China's Inner Mongolia. 
Meanwhile, back on the lunar surface, the lander will continue its work undertaking scientific observations using its three primary instruments. There's a panoramic camera to map the topography of the landing site, an infrared spectrometer to determine the composition of the local geology around the landing site, and a soil measurement instrument to analyse the subsurface structure of the drilling point. The flight marks the first sample return mission to the lunar surface since the American and Soviet Union moon missions of the 1960s and 70s. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. Scientists have found two molecules in blood plasma which could help predict if someone with mild cognitive impairment will progress on to develop Alzheimer's disease. The findings reported in the journal Nature are based on data from almost 600 patients with mild cognitive impairment. After modelling different combinations of compounds found in blood, researchers discovered two specific biomarkers paired together which best predicted cognitive decline in dementia over four years. The authors say their findings demonstrate the value of using specific combinations of blood-based biomarkers to make individualised predictions about the progression of Alzheimer's. A new breakthrough in ultra-efficient thermoelectric materials could lead to the development of body heat-powered personal devices such as wristwatches. A report in the journal Advanced Energy Materials suggests the new advances will allow for more efficient conversion of heat into electricity. The process of heat harvesting takes advantage of the free, plentiful heat sources provided by things like body heat, cars and industrial processes. Researchers say it could ultimately lead to potential applications ranging from low-maintenance solid-state refrigeration to compact zero-carbon power generation, possibly including things like small personal devices powered by the body's own heat. Imagine a pacemaker that doesn't need batteries, a personal smartphone that doesn't need charging, or a health monitor that's always working. A new species of carnivorous dinosaur has been discovered in Argentina. Paleontologists unearthed the 69-million-year-old late Cretaceous to Pterosaurian theropod fossils at a dig site in northern Patagonia. A report in the Journal of South American Earth Sciences claims Nibla Antiqua would have been about 4.5 metres long. The discovery is based on two incomplete dorsal centra, where the dorsal ribs, a scapula and fragmentary skull bones, including a nearly complete brain case and the tip of the right dentary. An 81-year-old midnight snapper caught off the coast of Western Australia has taken the title of the oldest tropical fish recorded anywhere in the world. The octogenarian fish was found at Rowley Shoals, about 300 kilometres west of Broome, and was part of a study that has now revised what science knows about the longevity of tropical fish. Researchers identified 11 individual fish that were more than 60 years old, including a 79-year-old red bass. Australian Institute of Marine Science fish biologist Dr Brett Taylor, who led the study, says the midnight snapper beat the previous record holder by two decades. The research will help scientists understand how fish length and age will be affected by climate change. Marine scientists are able to accurately determine the age of fish by studying their ear bones, which contain annual growth bands that can be counted in much the same way as tree rings. Although you've got to admit there's something rather ironic and sad about the fact you've got to kill the fish in order to determine how old it is. The rise of the gigabit internet in Australia and around the world and 5G's dirty little secret are two of the topics dominating the world of technology right now. With the details, we're joined by Alex Sahar of Reut from ITY.com. Gigabit internet is 1,000 megabits. And, you know, in Australia, we talk about 100 megabits. And, you know, I remember when the first modem was for 300 bits per second. Now I we talk about those. megabits and remember gigabits. The noises? I used to whistle along to it. And I remember when the 56K modems had a different sound to the earlier. They all had a different sound to each other as, yeah. as time went on. But look, the gigabit speeds are now becoming much more widely available. They've been available in places like South Korea and Hong Kong for the last few years. My cousin has one a gigabit connection at his place in Hong Kong. And, uh, you know, I was 
seeing speeds of 900 megabits download, but you know, 300 megabits would be a bad day. <laughs> and um, you know, in Australia for many years before we had the NBN, which brought a mixture of fiber to the node, um, fiber to the curb, and fiber to the premises directly as well as wireless. ADSL too was giving people average speeds across Australia of five megabits. So we've come a long way since then, and there's a lot further to go, both with fixed fiber and with wireless in 5G. Australia's internet's still a bit of a hodgepodge, really, isn't it? It is. As I mentioned before, fiber to the node, fiber to the curb, and then fiber to the premises, where fiber goes right to your house as opposed to going to a box at the end of the street, which then uses copper to come to your place. I mean, that's still a much faster way than plain ADSL. VDSL is what it's called, and VDSL was being tested in 2000. Unfortunately, we didn't go with a fiber to every home scenario, which unfortunately would have taken a lot longer to build and would just would have been much more expensive. But now, now that the Mark One MPN has been built, they're now going to spend four and a half billion dollars to give people fiber if they're willing to pay for fast internet speeds. And today in Australia, a gigabit connection is available for as low as $150 a month, much cheaper than it was before. And uh, in places like the US, there are plenty of providers that have gigabit fiber options. And uh, in Japan, I remember three or four years ago hearing that they had two gigabit services already. So the wired world is only getting faster. But of course, the other side of the equation is 5G. And there's a dirty little secret there. Tell me about it. Yeah, well, I've been using some 5G devices and I've noticed that whilst I can get some really fast download speeds on 5G, the upload speeds haven't been as impressive. And I've noticed when I do speed tests against 5G and 4G in the same location that uh, I can get very good download speeds with 4G, sometimes just as fast or even faster than the 5G. And often the upload speeds are faster as well. But look, I've been able to get on two different networks speeds of almost 500 megabits or almost half a gigabit. But normally you're getting anywhere from sort of 40 megabits up to 100, 200, 300. It just depends where you are. And sometimes it's, it's less than 100. Other times it's over. The d- upload speeds I've noticed have been, you know, 6.96 when I'm getting a, a download speed of 80. Or uh, another example here is I'm getting a, 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 had a download speed of 10.9 megabits and an upload speed of uh, 5.74. So you can get slow speed just because you're on 5G. Just because it says 5G doesn't mean it's all super fast all the time. Yeah, there, are, there are times when you can get to 4G just as fast. But I think this is because 5G still hasn't been as widely rolled out yet as it as it will be. How does Australia compare to the rest of the world when it comes to download and upload speeds? Well, having a look at the World Population Review website, they've got Singapore at number one with 191 megabits average download speed, South Korea number 255, Taiwan 151, Hong Kong 151, and Romania in uh, the top five at 130. We've got the United States at 115, but we have to go all the way down past New Zealand at 21 the 21st spot with 96.97 megabit average download speeds. Australia is down in 60th place with 40.37 megabit download speeds. In fact, it's mobile average, according to this particular site, of 63.34 megabits on a wireless connection. is faster than what we get on wired. But at home, I'm on a 100 megabit connection, and I regularly get peak speeds of you know at least 80, and I get upload, peak, peak upload speeds of 30. So it just depends. I mean, this is a countrywide average. And at the bottom of the list, we have Yemen at 3.54 megabits and Turkmenistan 176 at 1.76. So it's it's so downloads. We're speed pretty bad, but maximum. we could be worse. Well, if we had gone with fiber 10 years ago and built that across the country, we would be having speeds similar to Hong Kong and Singapore, right at the very top. But over the next few years, the government will be spending billions of dollars to upgrade people to fiber if they want to pay for those extra speeds. And because those faster speeds are dropping in price, I reckon a lot of people will take it up. That's Alex of royt from ity.com. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. 
Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more Space Time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Space Time YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 